Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us on live stream for our service today. We're so grateful that we can worship the Lord together, even as we are in separate places. We can lift our hearts to him together. We can lift our voices to him together and sing and hear his word and proclaim his glory. And so let's do that with joy. Let's do that today and sing to him and worship him. Scripture reading today is going to be from Psalm 80. You can read along in your homes with me. Psalm 80, beginning with verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine. 
that we may be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall turn back from you. We shall not turn back from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved.
pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. No one, nothing compares to you. We ask you, Father, to help us. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Even now as we go to your word, Lord, we want our hearts opened to who you are. Your goodness and your greatness, Father. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning again. And I sincerely hope um, that in the midst of the craziness of this season, the difficulties of life during a pandemic, the real and burdensome decisions that have to be made, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of our circumstances, I hope that you were able to experience true and deep thanksgiving this week. Today is our first Sunday of services being all online since midsummer, and it happens to be the first Sunday of Advent as well. And the theme for this first Sunday of Advent is hope. Hope. I think that is a good thing for us today. When we consider hope as it relates to Advent, how a people longed for a Savior, Messiah, to come and deliver them from their enemies. That hope, that hope of a people was fixed on a person. And even in the midst of him coming on his own terms, on terms that they did not expect, terms that left even John the Baptist asking, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Those terms did not steal their hope. And it should not diminish ours. And so let's look at the text today through the lens of hope. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 19. And the main way, the primary way, that I want to do that is through the lens of childlikeness. Children are amazing. I love kids. They have this wide-eyed way of looking at the world. Everything seems to be full of hope. Even if they ask a question and they get a no, they will ask a million times more because something in them tells them, if I just keep asking, I'm going to get what I'm hoping I will get. It's hope and it's child likeness. And remember that when Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as them, as children, there's something wonderful, there's something hopeful about child likeness. Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 7. We're going to read through verse 19. Go ahead and follow along as I read. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, 
let him hear. But what to, to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Your word is truth, and we are guided by it. We're grown through it. You tell us in your word, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. So help us build our faith through your word this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Remember, as we get to this text today, John sent disciples just before this to ask Jesus if he was the Messiah or not. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus responds really by saying, remember my word, John. Look at the things that I'm doing. Consider the things that are happening and relate it to the word. And now Jesus turns and addresses the crowd. And I want to talk about two things as it relates to this text. The first is the fruit of childishness. And second, the fruit of childlikeness. This passage isn't just about John the Baptist and how great he was. It's about the people and their childish versus childlike behavior. Now to be clear, Jesus is absolutely defending John's honor here before the crowd. John's disciples have just left after asking Jesus if he really was the Christ. And John was obviously struggling with doubt. Doubt about this, who Christ is, because he never expected that the coming of the King of Kings would result in him sitting in prison. And Jesus begins to ask the crowd a series of questions about John and his defending him in these questions. We're going to look at these things that that he highlights about John as we work through the two points, childishness and childlikeness. So what is the fruit of childishness? Three things we could look at. The first thing is this. Those who are childish are insatiable or they're never satisfied. That's what Jesus sees in his generation. Look at verses 7 through 10. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will, who will prepare your way before you. The people who had once gone after John the Baptist have grown cold. We see in verse 19, many think he is demon-possessed. Now imagine that as you consider the beginning of John's ministry and all of them going out after him and how their hearts have changed. They're never satisfied. Verse 7, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? You might Imagine that with John's recent doubts in particular, some people might consider that John is fickle. Jesus is saying not at all. John is no swaying reed. That would be childishness. And you consider Paul's words to the church in Ephesians chapter 4 and the desire and design of the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, the goal of the church in Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. John was not like the people. He was more like what the church is designed to become. He was not a reed shaken by the wind. What caused the people to travel such distances into the wilderness to see this man is he was more like the man that the psalmist writes about in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. Jesus goes on in verse 8, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? What, What picture does that give? Those who are dressed in soft clothing are those who kiss up to the king. Kiss up to those above them. Try to flatter to get rewarded with a high office and an easy lifestyle. That was not John at all. He had not kissed up to the king. Rather, he had confronted the king. And now instead of living as one who flattered the king, he is suffering as a prisoner. But those things are childish things. Not at all what John was like, and that's what Jesus is highlighting here. Jesus is showing that the people themselves are childish and that they are insatiable. They're never satisfied. Look at verses 16 and 17. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates we played the flute for you and you did not dance we sang a dirge and you did not mourn this is how the people are that jesus is addressing childish and the picture he's painting here is of children wanting to play wedding but people say no that's too silly and so the children want to play a funeral, and then the people respond, no, that's too serious. That's how they were with John. They went out and were so excited, but the excitement passed. Too serious, they now say. It's not what John was like. He was a prophet, and more than a prophet. His message was consistent. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Christ is coming. He is greater than I am. And so Jesus is saying of his generation that they are childish and that they are never satisfied. That is a fruit of being childish, being insatiable. A second fruit of childishness is rebellion. Rebellion. The people never being satisfied resulted in rebelling. Verses 18 and 19. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The people want things their own way. They don't want to play with Jesus. They don't want to do what he has come to to do. They don't want to align with his program. They are rebellious. They used to be filled with enthusiasm about John. Now they say he's too harsh. His message is too severe. He's not sociable. He must have a demon. But Jesus is too sociable. He eats and drinks and hangs out with even tax collectors and sinners That's what drunkards do. He must be a drunkard. You see their childishness. They just aren't satisfied. They're rebellious. No matter what you say to them or show them or tell them, they just will not give in. That is a fruit of childishness. 
The third fruit of childishness we see in these people is self-righteousness. I'm going to pull from Luke's account of this text for a moment because in the midst of this account in Luke's gospel, in Luke 7, he gives a parenthetical statement or note. Luke 7, 29 and 30 is this parenthetical statement that's made. When all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just having been baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. The Pharisees and lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. The epitome of childishness is found in the words, I can do it myself. That is what the Pharisees and lawyers are saying, almost stomping their feet. We don't need to go with your program, Jesus. Ours is fine. We have Abraham as our father. We are right. Your purpose and your way is wrong. We don't need you. We can do it ourselves. It's childishness. It's deadly thinking. It's foolishness. Paul says of this exact kind of thinking and these exact people in Romans 10, 1 through 3, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. They're self-righteous. They're childish. They refuse to submit to God. They refuse to believe Jesus. They refuse to repent. These Pharisees and lawyers were the ones who taught the Scriptures. They knew the law but did not submit to it. And so as Jesus says, John comes, this, this man who is more than a prophet, meaning that he was a prophet, but also one who had been prophesied about. He mentions Malachi 3.1, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So John comes preaching repentance, and they have the scriptures that the Pharisees knew and taught, all of them speaking of Jesus but they don't repent. Jesus now comes fulfilling all Scripture, preaching the kingdom, bringing the kingdom, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons full of grace and truth, and still they refuse to repent. They bear the fruit of childishness. Childlikeness is commended by our Lord. It is imperative that we become as people childlike and not childish. Matthew 18, 3, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean by like children? What are the characteristics he's referring to here? There's a difference between being childish and being childlike like. So how are we to be childlike? What's the fruit of childlikeness? The first is this. Those who are childlike trust. They trust. We saw in Luke 7 that there were some who, after hearing Jesus' words, declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But what are they saying? What are they saying in that? They're saying, we trust you. We trust you. You're right and we're wrong. They had been baptized. They trusted that they needed to fall in line with the plan and program of God. Baptism was a sign of repentance, of dying to self. They're saying, we trust you. We'll do what we need to do to get right with you. The second thing, fruit of childlikeness is they follow. 
Those who are childlike follow. They do what they are asked to do. They get in the water and they repent of their sins and they're baptized. They follow. That's what it looks like to become like children and enter the kingdom. Like a child who tags along with their mom or their dad and wants to mimic them, wants to follow them and do what they do. That's childlikeness. And these people, even tax collectors, are responding with childlike faith. You're right, Lord. We're wrong. We repent. We want to be like you. We want to follow you. And then the third fruit of childlikeness is they want to be helped. Those who are childlike want to be helped. When a child is childlike rather than childish, they want help. They accept help. They don't stubbornly say, I can do it myself. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what they said. But the childlike know they need God. They declared him just, Luke writes. In verse 11 of Matthew 11, Jesus says that among those born of women, none is greater than John. It's an incredible statement because he's just stated how great John was. It's incredible, but John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, and Jesus is bringing a new kingdom and inviting in citizens to this new kingdom. And so he continues, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. The one who enters the kingdom the one who is truly childlike, the one who is not born only of woman but of the Spirit, even the least of them is greater than John. Jesus is saying that those who trust in Him, those who follow Him, those who recognize they need to be helped by Him, those who are childlike, They are a part of the kingdom of God. They are born again. They're born of the Spirit, and they are greater than John. This doesn't mean that John wasn't saved and won't be in heaven. It's a statement about the greatness of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and the redemption that he brings. In verse 19, It ends with Jesus saying, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Wisdom is justified by her deeds. Wisdom is justified by what it accomplishes in the hearts and lives of all of those who allow themselves to be guided by wisdom. There's fruit in that, Jesus is saying. There's fruit in that in how we respond to who he is. And so I would ask you, are you more childish or more childlike? Are you expecting God to accept you on your own terms? That's childish. You have to die to yourself. You have to get with the kingdom of God. Children, children of God are childlike. They manifest, they display the qualities of the kingdom of Jesus. Childlike qualities. They trust Him. They follow Him. They depend on Him alone for their righteousness. I would say to you, if you realize that you are not childlike, if you refuse to come to Christ as he demands, then repent. The Bible tells us he will not turn us away. If we come to him on his terms, he will never turn us away. If you are today a child of God, trusting him, following him, depending on him alone, then embrace him. Be childlike. 
One of the great things about children is they're not too grown up to express their childlike love. Be childlike. I want to mention in closing verse 12. Verse 12 says something interesting. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. What does that mean? Jesus is saying this, there is opposition to the gospel of the kingdom of God. Whether it's by Herod or whoever, there is opposition to the gospel of the kingdom of God. And Jesus had prepared them for this throughout chapter 10. And his life, the life of Christ, will be a display of that in the ultimate extreme. He will be crushed for our iniquities. But he makes this statement here in the midst of this, in hope. The hope that he has come and that he has overcome for us and calls us to respond to him simply as a child, to trust him, to follow him, to want to be helped by him. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. Even as we are separated in our homes, we acknowledge you are far too gracious to us. We don't deserve the kindness that you continue to show to us. We don't deserve that, Lord. You're good and everything you do is good. And Father, we pray that you would bless us. Bless us with hearts that respond as children, that trust you, that follow you, that seek out your help, that accept, embrace your help. Help us to be children in these days, Lord. In the separate homes right now, I pray for childlike faith. And we pray that you would do what you can do. That you'd bring an end to this pandemic. That you would bring about healing and help. That you'd bring us back together with even greater joy and trust in you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are and all that you have accomplished for us. Jesus. And we pray it in your holy name. Amen. Have a good day.